I'll show you what I like most of all about these streets. They're a hidden secret. This is going to involve a bit of breaking and entering. The entrance has been sealed up now. It's choked with all the rubbish that people seem to have thrown over the fence in their neat gardens on either side. But if you persevere and hack your way through, you arrive at the lost kingdom of Yule, the Shangri-La of the Howell Hill Estate. It's the patch of land in the middle of this triangle of houses. This is the essence of spec builders planning, an estate that somehow leaves a hunk of land cut off and unusable. But his history reveals an even more characteristic gap between intentions and results. When Longley, the developer, submitted his plans to the Rural District Council, he showed this plot in the middle as three tennis courts. But by the end of 1928, when all the houses round about had been sold, Longley had abandoned the idea of tennis courts. Now he was asking for permission to build two houses here instead. Well, of course, all the people who'd now bought houses round about objected, and the wrangle went on over the years. At one stage, the local residents were going to buy it for £100, and build their own sports club. In the end, the war came along and preserved it as allotments. My friends and I built sheds, camps, hideouts here. I should think over the years, we built more in this area than Henry Banks Longley and Arthur Searle did. At the end of the war, the local residents got together and built the most enormous bonfire here to celebrate VE Day. It was somewhere you could adapt to circumstance, somewhere open to events. Now look at it. Some plots carefully tended, some left to grow wild. People say there are foxes here. I think there might be lions and tigers for that matter. When you see this estate from ground level, it looks quite arbitrary, but it's not. From above, you can read its history like the pages of a book. Gillian Tyndall, not long ago, published a history of Kentish Town called The Fields Beneath. She took the title from something she'd seen written up on a derelict house. The fields lie sleeping underneath. So they do here. Wheat and mustard grew in this soil 50 years ago, and the puny, hand-to-mouth efforts of Henry Banks Longley and the Rural District Council haven't been able to obliterate the old field shape. This is simply the old 10-acre field of Martin's farm, and Longley has had to fit his estate into its boundaries. The field was clipped on its west side by the railway. An early line, this one, built in 1847 to carry people to Epsom to drink the waters and see the racing. But the southern boundary of the field is much older, because before this was 10-acre field, it was part of the huge hunting estate that Henry VIII established around Nonsuch Palace, and its edge was the main road from Yule to Cheam. When Henry enclosed the land in 1538, the old direct road had to be diverted in this preposterous curve around the edge of the King's Park. And the third boundary of the field is older still. It's this track, the old bridle path, that ran from Epsom to Cuttington. And Cuttington was the hamlet that Henry VIII demolished to make room for Nonsuch Palace. It's the same throughout the district. The present has to accommodate the past. Here, hidden behind the semis of Queensmead, are the old labourers' cottages of Martin's farm, converted now, of course. And here's the path from the cottages to the farmhouse. The farmhouse is gone now, disappeared beneath the sea of Gleason's houses. It was a rather grand place when I knew it, none such court. I used to play in the grounds at the very first school I went to, run by a lady called Miss Dunk. I was in a gang at that school led by a girl called Diana Gibson. She appointed me gang scientist, since I wore spectacles. My job was to manufacture explosive. 
Any raw materials I could ever find were powdered chalk and crushed elderberries. A bit further on, you can pick up another old path going down into Yule Village. Another housing estate on one side and a private school on the other. But we're going to turn off on this path. This is Portway, the old drover's road. It's the old green way that shepherds used to drive their flocks along on their way in from the Downs to London. And it's still green. If you follow Portway North, you come to the oddest place in the district. You come to the ancient village of Cuddington. This is Cuddington here. Gone. Because Henry VIII wiped the entire place off the map. He was preparing the ground for the greatest Tudor-style suburban villa of them all. Nonsuch Palace, built to rival Hampton Court, to be the non pareil of all Europe. The bijou baronial halls and the little palaces of Collindale all roll into one. Though when you come to look at it, it is a bit short on Tudor detail. They should have got some good spec builder to tell them what a Tudor house looked like. Still, when you walk through its ancient courts now, you can't help noticing one extraordinary feature. It doesn't exist. It's gone like Cuddington before it. In fact, it disappeared so completely that some historians thought it had never been here at all. They thought it must have been at Sheen, eight miles away. Then when the war broke out, anti-glider trenches were being dug in the park here, and a local antiquarian saw what he thought were the foundations. In 1959, the local librarian, John Dent, organized a huge archaeological dig, and he laid bare the whole outline of the building. Now, these stones mark the spot. What happened? Well, Charles II gave it to his mistress, Lady Castlemaine, waged it, according to one story, on a horse called Thump at Newmarket. And Lady Castlemaine pulled it down to pay her debts. But it's still got the best back garden in Ewell. And running along the edge of the park, there's another strange ruin. It's a new concrete highway, built to restore the direct line of Portway, the straight road from Ewell to Cheam that Henry VIII disrupted. It was begun in the 30s, interrupted by the war, and then abandoned. Now, it's overgrown with brambles, the birds sing, and people walk their dogs along it. The last outward leap of London, caught by time and arrested forever in mid-action, like one of those figures on the Grecian urn. The last thing they built before the picture froze was this, a pedestrian underpass to carry that ancient bridle path from Epsom to Cuddington safely under the traffic. I just did a history that history made irrelevant. So why didn't I stay in this delightful place? Well, even if your parents lived in the Garden of Eden, you'd still want to leave by the time you were 16 or 17. For years, I used to tell people I lived in Epsom. I argued that more people had heard of Epsom, but really, I was just embarrassed by the very sound of the word Yule.
I'd stand up here on the bridge sometimes. Be waiting for a train up to town. Go meet my friends in various West End coffee houses. Places of the most glittering metropolitan sophistication, as they appeared to me. And I'd look up the tracks towards London. And it seemed to me that life commenced at just about the point where those sweet, straight, parallel lines converged. But it wasn't just adolescence. I think a lot of people in my generation were looking for the same thing. The city, straight lines, a completely planned and designed environment. What we wanted was a world made fully subject to the mind of man. So we turned our back on the garden suburbs and we recolonized the inner city. That was the way our imaginations worked on the world. By then, the air in the city was clean. Houses in the inner suburbs were cheap because the middle classes had all moved out here to the outer suburbs. to change now. All the same, when you look at some of the baronial halls and palaces we've brought into existence since, mostly for other people to live in, it makes you think. You can't help wondering if we've added all that much more to the sum of human happiness than old Henry Banks Longley and Arthur Searle did after all. Thank you. 